A phenomenal book. We were talking about it the other night uh, on the phone. Uh, a, a Bible friend of mine that just studies Bible, and we're going back and forth, Brother Ed and I, and we're talking. This book is so wonderful because every chapter, if you read through it, it will show you your need for salvation in Jesus. And yet, and so that's, that's wonderful. The waters are, are very inviting, and they're shallow, and you can come in. And yet, if you continue to wade into the chapters, they'll go over your head. I mean, they're deep. So it can take care of a baby Christian. It can take care of young men and fathers and giving them good doctrine. We've been uh, enjoying this. The 16th chapter, we've been working our way through, and, and the Lord is warning His disciples of the suffering that would come, and then the fact that He would send a comforter to them to get them through the suffering. We, we saw last week that the comforter, when He comes, He has a number of things He's going to be doing. The first thing He's going to be doing is to reprove the world. Verse 8, And when He has come, He will reprove the world of three things, of sin, and of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. The, the, the sin that is the cardinal, unforgivable sin today is not to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the Holy Spirit takes His ministry and concentrates that ministry as He deals with people in the world to show them that the problem they have is not so much that they commit adultery or that they steal or they do whatever other number of sins that they think may be uh, an offense to God, and they are offenses to God, but the great sin is not believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit reproves the world of sin because they believe not on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it's an interesting thing. He's reproving the world of sin because they believe not of me. Now, he said... When he has come, he will reprove the world. When the comforters come, he reproves the world. One of the reasons he's reproving the world is the very fact that he's here reproves the world. You see, go back to the first chapter in this gospel, John chapter 1. In, in John chapter 1, when it talks about the Lord Jesus Christ coming into the world, it says in verses 10 and 11, he was in the world. The Lord Jesus Christ was in the world. And the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Verse 11, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. Now, this is one of the reasons that the Holy Ghost is reproving the world, the Comforter is reproving the world. Is, is, the reproof is, Jesus ought to be here. And the fact that you did not know him and did not receive him, he came to be the king and to set up his kingdom. And the fact that he is not here, the Holy Ghost reproves the world and says, you know, you made a big mistake in letting him go. And the Holy Ghost wouldn't even be here in having this ministry had the people received the one that came into the world that made the world. Jesus would still be here. The millennial kingdom would have been set up. The New Jerusalem would have been sent down. Everything would have gone forward. Everything has been delayed because people crucified the Lord of glory. And so the Holy Ghost, just by being here, he proves to the world that they made a big mistake in letting the Messiah go. I guess he reproves the world by um, changing the dates on all the calendars. And so today is uh, July 4th, 2004. 2004 what? Anno Domini, the year of the Lord. I mean, he came to set up his kingdom. Where is he? Well, he's not here. So the Holy Ghost is in his place reproving us for being fools and not receiving him. They believed not on Jesus. We believe not on Jesus. So he reproves the world of that great sin. The next thing he reproves the world of is righteousness. I go to my Father, ye see me no more. Now, we saw three times in that verse, the I and the, and the uh, my and the me. And everybody talks, me, myself, and I, I, me, myself. Everybody talks about like that. Jesus has these three personal pronouns about himself to let you know that righteousness is of the Lord. And the righteousness is the righteousness of Christ. It's not the righteousness of the law. It's the righteousness of Christ. And this is what the Holy Ghost is reproving the world of, is that the only righteousness you can ever have is the righteousness of the, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that said, I, me, and my. It's my righteousness. It is not yours. It's not the righteousness of the works of the law. It's the righteousness of the faith of Christ. And so the Holy Ghost is working in the world, reproving the world of true righteousness. The world is running around seeking to establish a righteousness of their own. 
And the Holy Ghost is trying to reprove them constantly to come back to the true righteousness that's in Jesus Christ. This is his job in the world. Now, what he'd like is for you and I to get on board with him. Because we can be a great help down here to those that are lost in darkness whose minds have been blinded by the devil to the gospel of Christ and working with the Holy Ghost and letting them know the sin that you're committing that's going to be fatal on your behalf is not believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and the righteousness you're attempting to earn by your own good works is going to be filthy rags in God's sight. It's only the righteousness, the perfect righteousness of His Son. As we do these things, the Holy Ghost will work with us and reprove those people. So this is the, the work that he's doing in reproving them of the only righteousness that God will accept. The next thing he does in verse 11 is he's reproving the world of judgment. He reproves the world of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Now, the Lord had mentioned this back in the 12th chapter when his father spoke from heaven about glorifying himself and glorifying his name, Jesus answered and said in, in John 12, verse 30, John 12, 30, he said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world, and now shall the prince of this world be cast out, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men. He spoke of the judgment that was coming to the prince of this world. Now, the prince of this world, of course, according to New Testament teaching of the Bible, the prince of this world is the prince of this present evil world where there is spiritual wickedness in high places, principalities and powers at realm, the prince of the power of the air. It's the devil. It's Satan. It's the old dragon. And, and the Lord saying right here, he's being judged and Jesus taught this, and now the Holy Ghost is confirming this, and his job in the stead of Jesus down here is to reprove people of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Now, the point he's trying to make is this. So often, down here in the world, people get the idea, the notion, that they're above judgment. Many people get this concept. It's usually people that have attained great power in this world, that have attained great status in this world. And the fact of the matter is, often they are above judgment. They, they seem to be above the rules because they're the rule makers. And so they seem to get away with things down here. While those that are poor and do not have the necessary means to defend themselves end up getting thrown in the slammer, these people with the necessary means and the power seem to get through the system and work their way through it very well as they have a lot of silicone grease and they're able to grease the system and get through. But what, what the Holy Ghost is doing, he's saying, look, if the prince of this world, if someone as high has, spiritually speaking, as the devil, who is far above any human being, has been judged by God, do you think you're going to escape God's judgment? God has brought judgment upon the prince of this world. The angels have been judged. Turn back to the book of Jude, the book before Revelation. The, one of the errors that goes on down here is, is in, I guess, a desire to try and help God. Men try and refine the gospel. And one of the great refinements of the gospel that's happened in the last 80 years is the concept that you win people by telling them God loves you, God loves you, God loves you, God loves you. Matter of fact, I saw an advertisement in a magazine for churches. It's sent to pastors. I got, I got it just two days ago. And the advertisement was a full-color ad on, on you need this special sign for your church because signs will help get people in your church. And you put them out front and it lights up and they change all the messages. And, and the one beautiful church name was up there. And then inside the message was, God loves you, God loves you, God loves you three times to all the people driving by. And, and this is the kind of thing that... Uh, I don't know that that's a truism that you can put forth 
God loves a sinner in a committed sense that he desires what's best for that sinner and what's best is going to be obeying the work of the Holy Spirit which is recognizing that they have a sin of not believing on the Lord, that they have a righteousness that is not the Lord's and that's what they need. And uh, so the love that God has for a sinner is that of I want best for him but there is no relational love. There is no true back and forth love relationship going on between God and a sinner. I think everyone in this room can attest to it that there was a time in your life before you were saved where if, even if someone told you God loved you, you wouldn't believe it. And I think it's because you knew there was no love. There was no be you didn't love God. Why would He love you? And yet when the time came for every one of us, when we took Jesus Christ as our Savior, we entered into a relationship with God as a child of God and all of a sudden that love relationship started to flow both ways. Now, the gospel that's been kind of watered down talks about God's love. Jude wants to warn people, and he says in verse 5, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believe not. The prince of this world is judged. The Holy Spirit is going to let you know that the God of heaven is a God that brings forth judgment. To whom? To anyone that does not believe. Verse eight or 6, The angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved an everlasting change under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. God judges men and angels. From the least, they call the small to the great. From the lowest person on planet earth, who lives in squalid poverty and nobody knows and is completely anonymous, all the way to the prince of this world, the devil, God brings judgment. God is a God that brings a sure and a certain judgment. Back up a few books to the book of uh, Peter, Second Peter, chapter 2. And he's talking about false prophets and false teachers that bring in damnable heresies. Verse 3, he talks about them, and through covetousness, uh, they shall with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. And he's saying they're going to get judged. And they're going to get damned. Why? Verse 4, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness, and reserved them into judgment, then he talks about people he has not spared. He's going to... So the, the Holy Ghost is reproving the world of judgment. He's saying, look, if God judged the prince of this world, you think you're going to escape judgment? An honest presentation of the gospel will bring forth the fact that you're not believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. That the Lord Jesus Christ has the only righteousness that God will accept. Mm -hmm. And if you choose not to believe and not to receive that righteousness, you will be judged along with the devil and his angels. Matter of fact, the Lord Jesus taught this himself. Turn back to Matthew chapter 25. Again, so much of what the Holy Ghost is doing is merely bringing to remembrance the words of the Lord Jesus Christ and confirming them. He is doing, working a ministry in the stead of the Lord Jesus whom the world would not receive. And since the Lord Jesus went back to heaven, the world would not receive him. Now the Holy Ghost reproves the world of sin. Since he didn't believe on him, he's not here. You made a big mistake in letting him go. Matthew chapter 25. At the time of judgment, verse 41. Then shall he, the king, of verse 40, say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And the Holy Ghost will confirm this judgment, reproving the world of judgment because the prince of this world has been judged. You think you're going to escape? The same meter will be measured out to you. The Lord is just in his measuring out of judgment. And so the Lord prepared them for this and the Holy Ghost confirms the world of these three things. Sin, righteousness, and judgment. Going back to where we were in, in uh, John's Gospel, chapter 16, when he has come, he, the Holy Ghost, the Comforter, will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. The sin 
because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father. No man ascended to the Father, but he that came down from heaven. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And ye see me no more. The only chance you'll get to see him is if you follow him and you live in Christ and of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. You look at the three verses, the great problem on planet earth is, a, is sin. Verse 9. That's the problem down here. Sin. And the sin that's down here that's greater than all sins put together is not believing on Jesus. Verse 10 speaks of heaven, of righteousness because I go to my Father. Where is righteousness centered? Where did it originate? And where will it be finished in heaven? Even those of us that have received the righteousness of Jesus Christ know we're not completely righteous yet. We're waiting for the, the glory clothing of righteousness to be draped upon us and the veil of flesh to be thrown aside. We're waiting for that full righteousness. It started in heaven. He confers it on us doctrinally here, positionally, but it will not be complete until we get our glorified body. Righteousness is a heavenly thing. Judgment, that's a hell thing. Verse 11, you've got earth, you've got heaven, you've got hell in those three verses. 11, judgment, because the prince of this world is judged down into hellfire, which was prepared for the devil and his angels. Earth is a place of, uh, it's a trying ground, it's a proving ground for, for men and women created down here. So what's it all about? This is the great test, folks. You're going to be tested on one thing down here. What think ye of Christ? What will you do with Jesus? That's what earth is all about. This is the one test. This is the one practical exam God's giving you down here. Everything else is irrelevant. Your grades in school, your SAT scores, the, the, uh, the job reports they do at the plant, all these things are irrelevant compared to what will you do with Christ. Earth is a proving ground for hearts and souls. Will you believe what God has said about His Son? Will you seek out of the book of the Lord and read? And will you believe the sure word of prophecy and the uh, spirit and the testimony of Jesus Christ as a spirit of prophecy is going to tell you where you're going to spend eternity, where you're going when you leave this planet. When you leave this planet, you've got one of two choices, uh, verse 10 or verse 11. You go from 9 either to 10 and you skip 11 or you go from 9 to 11 if you choose to bypass 10. And those are those three verses right there. And that's the work of the Holy Ghost, the Comforter, reproving the world. That's His work for the world. But now we're going to move from the Spirit's work on the world and His reproving of the world in those verses to three things that he's going to do in these verses that are only going to be for the believer. Because the Lord has much more to say to his children than he has to those that are outside of the household. And the Holy Spirit is doing his greatest work with God's children. He is working in the world to, to reprove the world, and if someone will receive the reproof, he will move them into this family, at which point he will then counsel and comfort and connect. But if they re refuse and reject the reproval, then they get none of the, of the relationship that God would have with you and I down here. God loves you, God loves you, God loves you. No, God uh, wants the best for you, and God will enter into a love relationship with you, but His Spirit is trying to reprove you that you are a sinner and you need a Savior, and that Savior has come, and the world rejected Him, but you need not reject Him. You can receive Him if you still have life and breath in you. Amen. And if you do, now the work of the Comforter becomes personal, and you will know the love of God. As the, the love of God is shed abroad in your heart through the Spirit that He's given, whereby you will cry, Abba, Father. And now we'll look into the next part of this chapter. Let's see what the work of the Comforter is for the disciples. Because they were troubled in that upper room. Sometimes we're troubled in the lower rooms down here, going on planet Earth. Here's what he'll do. He'll counsel the believer. Verse 12, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it to you. All things that the Father hath are mine. 
Therefore said I, he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. Now, what he's going to do is he's going to give counsel to the child of God. In the multitude of counselors, there is safety, the Bible says. This is a dangerous place where you and I live on planet Earth. It's a mixture of the good influence of God and the evil influence of the prince of this world. And sinners and transgressors have multiplied wickedness in this earth. And we're outnumbered down here. And we need a counselor to help us get through the maze of this life. So, the first thing Jesus said, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. The first thing it's telling you is just in the way the Lord dealt with his disciples is the same way the Holy Ghost will deal with you. The Holy Ghost and the Comforter will work with you the same way the Lord worked. He's going to take of mine and give unto you, Jesus said. He's going to follow in my ministry. The Holy Ghost's ministry now spiritually is doing that what Jesus Christ did with his disciples. Isn't that a blessing? Sometimes you wonder, boy, if I only could have been with Jesus. If you have Christ as your Savior, then that Spirit will work with you the same way Jesus worked with those disciples. Now, the way Jesus worked with the disciples, verse 12, is he told them right there, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. The first thing the Lord understood about his disciples is that they grew as young saplings and young plants. The Lord taught this terrible uh, parable, <laughs> terrible parable, <laughs> back in, in Matthew 13. He taught a parable in Matthew 13 about a sower going forth to sow seeds. And then he taught about the kingdom of heaven in verse 24 is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. And then he explained it in verse 37. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man, the field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. So Jesus understands, he says, the way that I take a new birth is I take a seed and I plant it. And the way it grows is slowly. It's a young sapling. And then it gets a little bit bigger and it's a small tree and then it gets larger and it's a full-size strong tree. And the Lord says, I have many things to say. In other words, I have weights to put on this young sapling to, to, so it can bear the burdens of the other Christians and so fulfill the law of Christ but I don't put a burden on it until it's ready even working with these disciples he realized there were certain burdens they were not ready for now in you and your personal walk with the Lord you're going to find that when you first are saved the Lord gives you more joyful news and grace than he gives you the burdens of the old and the new nature the fact that that you're a disciple and the world hates you. All these things he doesn't teach you in the beginning. He establishes you with grace. And so this is the way he worked with his disciples. That's why he said, when, when I was with you, I protected you. But now that I'm leaving, after three and a half years, now you're going to face the onslaught. And he does the same thing with us. When we're young, he treats us as babes in Christ. As we grow, he gives us a few burdens to start to fulfill the law of Christ. Even at this point, they were not ready to take everything. He knew that Peter needed to grow more. He knew that John needed to grow more. John wasn't ready for the Isle of Patmos three weeks after Jesus ascended. John wasn't ready for many years later. Peter wasn't ready to be crucified upside down. There were many things he had to say, but they were not ready to bear them. There are many things that he'll want to teach us, but he won't teach until we're ready. The Holy Spirit does the same thing in counseling us. That's why we have to be so careful in ministering the Word of God to believers. Sometimes we want to lay things on them. The Holy Spirit's not ready to lay on them. Thankfully, the Holy Spirit comes along with a sword and cuts them off. But we have to be so careful. The Lord works with us and He brings us to certain points in our lives. And sometimes we want everyone to catch up where we are. That's the Holy Ghost ministry, to let people know when they're ready to bear something. So... I have many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. That's how Jesus worked. That's how the Holy Ghost works. Now, verse 13, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he'll follow in my footsteps, he will guide you into all truth. The Holy Spirit's job is to guide you and to me into all truth. 
Now, what is truth? Well, Jesus said in the 14th chapter, I am the way and the truth and the life. So Jesus is truth. And the other truth is John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So the Holy Ghost is going to guide us into the Bible to Jesus. He will not just guide you into the Bible alone. The Holy Ghost will use the Bible as a means to bring you close to Jesus. He will guide you into all truth. If he just guided you into the Bible, he'd be guiding you into part of the truth. Jesus is the truth. The Bible is truth. The Holy Ghost guides you into the Bible to bring you to Jesus. Let me show you. Go to 1 Peter. No, 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1. Again, uh, when I was first saved, we were doing a Bible study in my family room. Everybody was kind of sitting around, all different versions of the Bible. What does yours say? What does yours say? What does it mean to you? Was it, there was really no teaching. There was just kind of uh, playing in a sandbox. No real doctrine. But, but at one point, we're kicking it around about um, somebody said, you know, and I think they were frustrated because there was no real teaching going on in the Bible study. Somebody said, you know, I just wish Jesus were here to teach us. You know, I wish I, wish I could be with Jesus. To, I, I wish Jesus, I could have walked with Jesus, is the, the bottom line. And he was very frustrated because he didn't get a chance to walk with Jesus. Now, here's someone that walked with Jesus. This is Peter himself. And Jesus walked with uh, Peter and taught Peter many things. And Peter got to observe him and got to... Uh, probably sleep out on, in a tent with him, do some sleep outs with him as they were going from town to town because the birds have nests and the foxes have holes and the son of man didn't have anyone to go. So they would sleep out under the sun or under the moon and get up in the sun. And they spent a lot of time together. And Peter got to see a lot of things. And he says in verse 16, um, 15, Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. I saw everything. I'm telling you what I saw firsthand, Peter's saying. Verse 17. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, uh, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. He's saying, look, I, I walked with him, and not only that, I remember one day he took us up into the mountain, and he was transfigured before us, and I saw him change his entire form. I had to kind of look like this, because it was so bright. And, and then there were two other guys there, Moses and Elijah, and they were all talking, and then God spoke from heaven, and I saw the whole thing. Man, that's the kind of revival Benny Hinn's looking for. I mean, that's, you're just looking for, I mean, this is the kind of stuff people are groping around and searching for. And Peter says, I was there. And, and the guy at the Bible study then was going, I wish I had been there too. And then Peter cautions and says, verse 19, but we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed. Peter's saying, now that I think about it, now that it's been Oh, 15, 20 years since that happened. That experience happened to me 15, 20 years ago. And you know it's kind of distant and remote. I mean, I kind of remember, but I, I can't quite... It's kind of slipping in my mind. I rem have you ever had something happen to you and it was real fresh in the first few days, but then it kind of fades and it's there and you can't quite get it back the same way? That's how life is, folks. We have, we have a feeble memory for things. And Peter's saying, I was there 15 years ago and... I remember it, but I don't fully remember it. But it was special, but I can't get my hands around it. I can't get my arms around it. But this book is more sure than that experience. This is more sure. You're better off to take heed to this Bible than you are to my experience of being up in the Mount of Transfiguration with the Lord. You do, you do well that you take heed unto this word, which is a real light that shines in a dark place. Because thy word is a lamp under my feet and a light under my path. This is what you got to get a, a handle on. And so that's why the spirit of truth will guide you into the word of truth. 
But through the word of truth, he will get you to see the Son of God who is truth. This is the work that the Holy Spirit is doing in counseling the believer. He's constantly trying to draw the believer into the sure word of prophecy, into the word of truth, to get our eyes to look at this, and then through the word of truth to get us to see Jesus. Now, there are two stumbling blocks along the way. Number one, we don't come to the word of truth. And many Christians do not come to the word of truth. Now, <laughs> One of the sad reasons is, and we're going to see a little bit later when we do some of our studies on, on the devil and his works, he confuses. He not only blinds the minds of believers, he puts confusion in the church. Now, God is not the author of confusion. ...of confusion. And his job is to put all kinds of counterfeit Bibles out there. So the Christian isn't even drawn to the Word of God. Now, the, the Spirit of Truth, he says in verse 15, All things that the Father hath are mine, therefore, said I, he shall take of mine and show it to you. The, 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 the Holy Spirit is not going to draw you into a word that's written by some translation committee that's got copyright uh, you know, benefits going that are putting money in and through covetous making merchandise of you like Peter warned, those are not, the Spirit is not going to draw you into that. He's going to draw you into that which is Christ, the Word of Christ, which is your Holy Bible, your King James Bible. There's only one Holy Bible. There's only one Savior. There's only one faith. Faith cometh by hearing the Word of God. There's only one Word of God. There's only one Bible. So the number one thing is the confusion in the church the Spirit has prevented a lot of people from coming to the Word of Truth. Now, if we can get past that obstacle, okay, now we know we have the Holy Bible, we have the King James Bible, we have the Word of Truth. I know in my own life the difference when I was messing around with something men wrote and finally getting to what God wrote, the difference was incredible how the Spirit was able to draw me to this and not only that, how to bring to remembrance the things I read in here and I couldn't remember the things I read in that, the Word of Men. That may appeal to the natural man, but it doesn't appear to the spiritual man. These things are spiritually discerned. So the first obstacle is you've got to get to the right Bible. But then the second obstacle I've observed, even people that have the right Bible, is the Bible becomes the end point of the study. And they use the spirit of truth just to guide them into part of the truth. But that's not what he's going to do. He shall glorify me. He will take you into the word of truth and glorify Jesus. And when the Bible just becomes a study book, even a King James Bible... And it no longer is used to bring your connective relationship to God, a real love relationship. God loving you, you loving God, and letting the Spirit of Truth draw you to Jesus Christ. That's just dead waters too. That's a broken cistern also. And I've met guys who just play Bible roulette with the Bible. And they're studying all kinds of doctrines here and there, and they're hyper dips, and they're going all over, and there's you got the dry cleaners and the wet ones, and, and all the different curious cults that are out there fooling around with this, this Bible, and they're not looking for a personal relationship with Jesus. They're just looking to be some kind of goofy Bible scholar out there. But he's going to counsel the believer to come into the word of truth to glorify Jesus. That's what he's going to do. He wants to bring you to the pure waters and then let you see Christ's reflection in that pure still water as he leads you beside the still waters. That's what the Spirit of Truth is trying to do in counseling the believer. The Spirit of Truth does not need you to be some Bible doctrine master out there. Take the pebble from my hand. You know, he, does, he doesn't need some kind of masters running around there, a grasshopper teaching everybody. What he wants is to get you into a relationship with God. God called you, God created you for the express purpose of his pleasure into having a personal relationship. He is father and you as child through Jesus Christ. And so this is what the Holy Spirit wants to do. When you go to the Bible, it's not, oh, I've got to go to the Bible, I look for a new message, I can teach somebody. You go to the Bible so you can spend time with the Lord. Just like Peter spent time on the mount, Peter says, now you spend time, take heed to this. And this will bring you right to Jesus. And the Spirit of truth will guide you into all truth. He shall not speak of himself. He shall glorify me. The crazy thing that, again, that I see is uh, people running around talking about the Holy Spirit. 
and the Holy Spirit's moving here and the Holy Spirit's and we got the Holy Spirit moving this morning at this service and the Holy Spirit's on this and they have churches where they teach about the Holy Spirit. When that's going on, you can be pretty sure the Holy Spirit isn't there. Because at no time does it say he will counsel the believer about himself. It says right here he would glorify Jesus. It says in verse 13, he shall not speak of himself. He doesn't do that. He's a perfect gentleman showing you the bridegroom. That's what he does. He shows you the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the Savior. The Holy Spirit is not the Savior. The Holy Spirit cannot save you. The Holy Spirit did not die at Calvary's cross for you. The, the Holy Spirit was not made in the likeness of sinful flesh that he could be a propitiation for sins. Jesus Christ is the part of the Godhead, the second person of the Godhead that is the Savior. And, and both the Father who's drawing you to Jesus and the, Son, and the, and the uh, Holy Spirit are trying to guide you into Jesus, to point you to Jesus so that you will have uh, repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. If anybody turns to God, I'm not sure if you're there, God. If you turn to God, He will tell you to place your faith in Jesus Christ. That's what, exactly what God will tell you to do. If you want to know if this is true, no matter what God it is you're praying to or reading about out there, if you get down on your knees tonight and you just, like I did in 92, are you out there? Do you really exist? And in 93, I, 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 you, know, are you, you know what He pointed me to? Jesus Christ. Don't worry about me. Get to know my son. That's exactly what God did. He got me in a Bible study in the Gospel of John that talked about Jesus, 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 Jesus. After six months, this thick head and this waxed heart melted, took Jesus as Savior, and then I realized, yeah, there is a God. And I got to know him through Jesus. And this is what the Spirit of Truth is doing. He's not speaking of himself. He's glorifying Jesus. He's receiving of Jesus, and he's showing it to you. All the riches in Christ are being shown to you in Christ, not in the Bible, not in the Spirit. He's not showing you the riches in the Spirit. He's not showing you the riches in the Bible. He's using the Bible to show you the riches that are in Christ Jesus. You can do all things through Christ, not through the Bible and not through the Holy Spirit. You do them in Christ, through Christ. It is Christ working in you. It is Christ living in you. And this is what the Holy Spirit's trying to get a hold of. Even Christians are missing this. Christianity is Christ. It's not a way of life. It's Christ. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Jesus Christ is the way of life, living through you and living in you. The Holy Spirit will counsel the believer. Then in verses 16 through 22, he will do another thing. A little while and ye shall not see me, and again a little while and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. Well, then said some of the disciples among themselves, What is this that he saith unto us? A little while and ye shall not see me, and again a little while and ye shall see me, and because I go to the Father. They said, Therefore, what is this that he saith a little while? We cannot tell what he saith. Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him, and he said unto them, Isn't that interesting? Jesus often answers the questions of your heart before you express them. What a blessing. He knows the thoughts of your mind and your heart and the intents of your heart. And often he'll give you an answer before you've asked the question. What a blessing. He's so tender and so, so careful for us. He tells us to ask. But sometimes you realize he, you're just afraid to ask. He's going to answer you anyways. He knows that there's a desire in some disciples to know truth, and he'll give the answer. So he said, Jesus knew they were desirous, verse 19. He said to them, Do you inquire among yourselves of that I said? A little while and you shall not see me. And again a little while you shall see me. Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful. But your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow, because her hour is come. But as soon as she delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for that a, a man, the joy that a man is born into the world. And ye now, therefore, have sorrow. But I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. The Holy Ghost, the Comforter, 
What he's going to do is comfort the believer. Now, Jesus said, I'm going to go. I'm going to leave. He says, a little while you see me, a little while, and ye shall not see me. Ye shall not see me. He knew there was going to be a time of separation between him and the disciples. So what did he provide? He provided a comforter to strengthen them in the time of separation. Now, for you and I, spiritually, there's, there's, there's no question, I have not seen Christ. We love him whom we have not seen. And so I've only seen him through the eye of faith and through the portraits painted in the precious word of God. What does the Spirit do for me and for you? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. He comforts us with love and joy and peace while we wait to see the bridegroom face to face. He worked in the lives of these disciples. Now, Jesus knew that there would be weeping and lamenting. Ver verse 20, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. Now, at the time... In the near future, Jesus knew there would be a three-day period for them. When the world would rejoice that the, that the Son of Man had been hung on the cross. And they said, crucify him, crucify him. And the chief priests and the Roman prelates and the guards and the centurions and the populace at large said, crucify him, crucify him. And they rejoiced at the death of Jesus Christ. And what about the disciples and the, and the, and the, and the women that followed and ministered to him? Well, they, they sorrowed. And they lamented. But he told them, Your sorrow shall be turned into joy, verse 20. <coughs> Your sorrow shall be turned into joy. And of course, we read what happened in uh, any one of the Gospels, in the last chapters of the Gospels, as we see the, 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 the day of the resurrection, when the Lord came out of the tomb, and he conquered Satan, and he conquered sin, and he conquered death. And Mary Magdalene ran, I've seen the Lord. And Peter and the disciples met in the upper room. And the Lord came in and he showed them the wounds. And then he sat down and he supped with them. And their sorrow was turned to joy as they saw the resurrected Lord. These are all things you and I have seen in the eye of faith. But just as they've gotten to see him in the glorified body, we know that the day's coming when he will call us to the clouds and we will see our Lord for the first time. John was given a prophetic picture of this in the book of Revelation when he got to see the Lord. And John's a type of the church. And so the Holy Spirit continues to comfort us with that truth in our hearts. Now this is the hope of salvation that we have. Now, I don't know if the Spirit's ever quickened you with this at certain times, but he's done it to me numerous times in my walk as a believer. He has quickened me with the, with the joy that I'm going to see the Lord. It's just, it's just a rejoicing thing that only the Spirit of truth can do inside your heart. I mean, one of the ways you know you're safe, sure we know we're safe from the Bible. I know I'm safe from the Bible. I, I read the verses. They tell me, He that hath the Son hath life. I've written to these that believe on the name of the Son that you may know you have life. I know that from a literal standpoint reading it here, but there's a, there's a comforting and a quickening inside my heart. The Holy Spirit stirs up every so often, and I love when He does that. I love when He stirs up the good gift of God that's inside me, and I get that quickening, rejoicing joy that only a believer can have as He comforts me, and you are going to, you're, you're lamenting now. He says, you're sorrowing now in the world but you're going to see your Savior. It will be worth it now when we see Jesus. We sing that song. It's such a precious thing that the Holy Spirit does only for the believer. The world does not get that comfort. That's why you see the sorrow in the people in the world. That's why you see them at the funerals the way they weep and lament. They don't have that. Only the Holy Spirit and the Comforter can do this. A woman, when she's in travail, she hath sorrow because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for the joy that a man is born into the world. Spiritually, doctrinally, this is going to take the Jews in the tribulation. Doctrinally, the woman, this is going to line up with Revelation chapter 12. The woman is in the tribulation. And the woman is going to be set out there in Revelation chapter 12. 
Let me see. She's going to flee into the wilderness. Verse 6, the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath the place prepared of God that they should feed her a thousand two hundred and three score days. So doctrinally, the teaching to these Jewish men in the upper room is there's going to be a, guy, a time of great tribulation where the woman is waiting for the man-child to come back and deliver her because she's already delivered him. You read through chapter 12 of Revelation sometime. But um, spiritually, for you and for me, the, the truth of the matter is, is that when we went through great sorrow in our lives, I don't know about you, but we went through great sorrow in our lives, at least I did, as I, I lived my life according to the best ways that I was taught down here. You know, we all go through life and, and we kind of pick and choose the way we're going to go through life. I tried to be, in my life, one of those thinking kind of people, you know, Rodan, the thinker. I like to read books. I like to get some philosophy. I tried the best way I could to live down here. I always felt the, the, the con contemplated and meditated life was the only life worth living. And so I, I would think about what I was doing with my life. Where am I going to go? I would set goals. I, I'll go to pre-med. I'll go to medical school. I'll, I'll finish my degree. I'll work a certain way. I'll, I'll be good at my craft. I'll, I'll be a husband. I had certain goals that I had established in my life. And as I went through and accomplished goals and walked down that road, I found sorrow. I found myself lamenting, confused, lost. Remember my best friend would say, what's the matter with you? I said, ah, nothing, don't worry about it. Let's just go to the movies. We'll go to the movies tonight. But I was lamenting. What, what I needed in my life was to be delivered of the child, the man that was born into the world. I needed that babe in Bethlehem's manger not just to become a matter of fact in my life, which is what he was, but to become a matter of faith. I needed to make the connection from my head to my heart. I needed that delivery process to, to deliver him from up here down into here. And when that happened, and I became part of the bride of Christ, it's a funny thing. He was born into the world, and the joy that I had, I didn't remember the anguish anymore. He took those things away. I mean, even sometimes now, people will talk to me, usually family members, about things in my past. And when they try and bring them up, I mean, that anguish is all gone. It's forgotten. It's, it's, it's gone. And you don't want to bring it up, but it's all scarred over. There's no nerves left there. Yeah. Scarred over tissue has no nerves in it. It's been healed. It, it's beautiful. And spiritually, that's what the Lord would like to do with a Christian, is to see to it that that, that, that full delivery process takes place. You know what happens so often with us is we compartmentalize Christ in our life. And we take him as our Savior in one room in our heart. And we leave a lot of other rooms where we haven't let him enter in. And if we'll just let him be delivered throughout the whole heart, then all the anguish will be taken. The lamenting and the sorrow and the anguish will be taken away in that joyful relationship. Sure, you're going to have trials and tribulations down here. He's going to tell you about them. But he's going to show you that he's overcome the world. You don't need to worry about those things. Spiritually, it's a precious thing. But this comfort only comes to the believer. You must believe. Do you believe? Have you believed that God has sent His Son into the world, His only begotten Son, to be a Savior, to take sin in your place, in your stead, so that you could believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and realize the greatest sin you've committed is not turning to God and placing your faith in the Lord Jesus. If you will do that, then you will get the counsel of the Holy Spirit. You will get the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Now next week we're going to show how the Holy Spirit connects us to God in an intimate way. So that love relationship that everyone talks about, God loves you, God loves you, God loves you, you can finally enter into that through Christ. But let me, let me caution you, let me be honest with you. The Holy Spirit, if you're still a member of the world and you're not a disciple of Christ, you're not a believer in Christ, He's, the Holy Spirit is reproving you of the sin of not believing on Christ and He wants to reprove you of judgment. God is angry with the wicked every day. God does not love sinners in a relational sense. But God loves the sinner in that He has the best for you. He's given His Son that you might turn from your sins and turn to the Savior. And then you can enter into relational love with God. That's the invitation that He has for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the teaching that the Lord Jesus Christ is the giver of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the work he does in reproving the world. Thank you that he did that work in my life when I was in the world. 
Thank you then as you delivered me from the world and now made me a child of God. He's counseled me and never given me anything before I was ready to handle it. And he comforts me as I allow Christ to have greater place in my heart.